Hello and welcome back. We have surely exhausted the topic of why uh, Fight Club and The Matrix are terrible <laughs> films for uh, growing young men to watch. Um, Nick, you went to the cinema this week and you've been teasing me all week with this story about something which uh, the only thing you'll say is, I want to talk about something on the podcast which really bothered me. And, yeah, no, uh, it really, really bothered me. This um, was kind of the equivalent of, of like the text you get from your partner which says, we really need to talk. Yeah, I want to do this on fr- I want to do this on Sunday, but I think we both got distracted by not this on Sunday. Um, yeah, quite. I've been like just full of uh, a creeping sense of dread all week about what the story <laughs> is going to be. That's right. I went to the cinema, and um, this is, I'm one of these people who has to turn up before everything begins. You know, I, I can't just sort of pop in after the lights have gone down. I have to sit, make sure I'm in my seat, and um, I watched some trailers. Go on. And the thing I wanted to talk about was the trailers for two movies I saw, which were uh, a film called Life and a film called Ghost in a Shell. Yes. Yeah. Um, Ghost in a Shell has come under fire for a lot of things, notably being a completely pointless like remake and also for basically casting a primarily Japanese animated cast of white people. Yes. But... Um, well, I'm going to complain about it in a completely new, fresh take. <laughs> is that the like what fucking plot can there be in the film that wasn't revealed in the fucking trailer? Oh, is it one of these trailers where you just think, okay, so that's basically just the whole film? I don't have to see yeah, that now. So, like, the tagline is they that the, was well, not a tagline, but like the whole gist of it is that like they stole her, they stole her past. So she now she's gonna take her future. So the idea is that like she thinks she's a cyborg that like was in an accident or something, but in actuality she's like they've wiped her past away from her or something. And it revealed all this in the trailer and the advertising. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm looking at it going, then what the fuck's in this movie? Because surely that's like a really good plot twist for you to reveal halfway through the film. Like yes, yeah, yeah. even if it's not the big plot twist. It's just an interesting thing for us to slowly get used to with the creeping idea of this in the movie. At the very so, least, it would be an interesting sort of end of end of the second act um, kind of game-changing plot twist, you know? Yeah, exactly. But instead, you've got this sort of idea that you're going to go into the cinema knowing at least one thing that has been played into the trailer. And it's like, sure. you know, I'm already going into this knowing this person's life is not real. Which means, how can you be invested in the first hour and ten minutes of the film? Then, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly, exactly. And then the next one was life, where these people find some lump of extraterrestrial stuff, and then a single cell organism starts to develop really quickly, yes. and take and start killing them all, and and like it was like the spaceship is, and in the in the trailer, they reveal the spaceship is crashing. And like, because it starts with them all being like a happy sort of family, like the Alien Covenant trailer they did, and yes, then yeah. slowly devolves to like things smashing, things exploding, the spacecraft crashing. Uh, Chris Evans, I think it is, with it inside him, uh, and and they're like, it's like if if this space station goes through the atmosphere, we'll all burn up in reentry. And then somebody goes, but the alien might not. And I'm like, well, first of all, bullshit. But, uh, <laughs> But second of all, um, second of all, what else could possibly be in this movie? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's basically, uh, from what I've seen of it, one, it looks like Alien, but they couldn't get the license to use H.R. Geiger's creature. Yeah, it, it's, it's Alien with the budget of gravity. Uh, yeah, it is, yeah, by, by, uh, by the look of it. And also, it, all take, it seems like it all takes place on the space station with a very small cast of characters, again, like Alien. Yeah. So it's basically a horror movie um, bottle episode, if you like, of a, of a, of a, of a TV show. Like, you're, you're, showing that you're showing it breaking up, unless you do a cop-out like, it, oh, that's like a premonition, or, you know, that's one of the astronauts, like, dreaming about that happening or something. You've kind of just given away yeah, you, you, a you've huge re- plot point of your film. you to me what's going to happen. So I walk into it like some kind of soothsayer who's like, I've seen all this before. <laughs> yeah, um. But it sort of it reminded me of a trailer for a film called Frankenfish. Okay, that's not. I'm not familiar with that. No, no one is. Um, it's one of those terrible B movies. It was in from a time before we started actually making B movies because, like you know, we made we, we make things like Lava Lantula now, uh, yes. and 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 
Sharknado and Giga Shark vs. Giant Octopus. Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus. I'm sorry, that's ridiculous what the first thing I said. Uh, <laughs> clearly, the second thing, it makes more sense. But, you know, we, we make these B movies now. There was a point where just bad films were made by accident. Yeah, yeah. And and Frankenfish most definitely was one of them. And I watched the trailer, and the trailer literally had every single plot point in from the film. Yes. Like, so it reveals that there's two of them. It reveals that one of them's female. It reveals that one of them's pregnant. It reveals all this in the trailer. It's a two-minute trailer, and it sums up the entire movie. At the very least, you can understand it with B movies, right? Because... You know, when B movies, or, or, or I guess at the time, you know, you'd probably just call them like you know low budget films. You know, like at that point, you know, they have to pack everything they can into the trailer. Like they have to pack mm. the trailer full of their most expensive shots, because then that makes the film look more expensive. And the trade off for that is that you maybe you give away some plot points, or but you know, it's it's a, it's a yeah. cheaply made B movie. Who cares? You know, but with the, with the trailers that you've just mentioned about you know giving away all these plot points like the budget of these films are you know in the tens to hundreds of millions you know we've got we're using the mentality of cheaply made look at this one expensive shot that we could afford um b movies to sell a hundred million dollar blockbusters and the really interesting thing is that the Ghost in the Shell marketing up until this point has been really quite decent. <laughs> they they cocked you know, it, it all up like with, with the final trailer. Yeah, they 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 did. No, they did. Like they used like loads of sort of they, like short internet bits. You know, they've like done sort of short mini trailers and teasers and sort of built up. And they had me moderately interested in it. And then they release the final trailer. Like, oh, so that's the plot of the film. Um... With this, in, with this in mind, I'd just like to offer a little bit of advice to anybody who's listening to this. If you are inclined to see Ghost in the Shell because Scarlett Johansson is predominantly naked in it, from the uh, judging by the trailer, like if that's if if you, if you can put aside all the hmm. all the difficulties about like oh you know it's it's casting white actors and and you know it doesn't look especially good in the first place but you know Scarlett Johansson's naked and I, you know, I'd like to see that go and watch Under the Skin I was just about to bring that up yeah Scarlett Johansson is fully naked in Under the Skin and it's a considerably better film than than Ghost in the Shell looks like it's a wonderful wonderful beautifully shot film and if all you care about is seeing Scarlett Johansson naked, then you might as well watch a decent film well, as like a byproduct of that. You know? I was I was having a conversation with somebody I know, and you know they're a fairly good friends, so I think they won't mind me saying this. Then they're not the sharpest tool in the shed. And um, I was having a conversation with them, and basically they were like, you know, I want to see Ghost and Shell because you know Scarlett Johansson is predominantly naked, despite the fact that they probably wouldn't say the word predominantly. And um, <laughs> So yeah, I, I basically said, look, you know, there's, you are aware that there's a movie called Under the Skin where Scarlett Johansson is actually physically naked rather than CGI wrapped up with nippleless plastic like she is. In yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just in show. And he's like, okay. And I expect him to go off and like look at MrSkin.com and actually check it out. But <laughs> in 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 his defense, he watched the entire movie. Oh, okay. So he comes to me and he says, I I've just I saw that film I saw Under, um, under the Skin. I'm like. Really? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I had absolutely no idea what the fuck was going on. I got very confused, and it challenged my worldview, but I got to see Scarlett Johansson's nipples. I, I think, but is there, like, a case to be made there, like, for expanding, um, like, people's perception of, of what film can be as an art form through the medium of soft pornography, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean... Like, like just, like, using using the... The promise of of nakedness as like a as like a lure to get people to watch actually well made art. Well, films. I, I I think that's what the seventies was about. <laughs> <laughs> like I I generally think you look at films like Zardoz, uh, which is you know the John Borman movie starring Sean Connery, which is, yes. attempts to try and create some form of Lord of the Rings style philosophical narrative, mm -hmm. but does furnish you greatly with a huge amount of tits. I have a little factoid uh, about that. You know, in sort of the golden age, so to speak, of Hollywood, yeah, um, where you had these huge epic stories, uh, like huge epic films, uh, epic films being made. Um, the whole, the whole reason why a lot of these big epic films were kind of biblically, or either biblically inspired or you know somehow biblical in nature, was because that was how the filmmakers got around 
the censors of the time. If their film was based on a biblical narrative, they could get away with way more violence and way more sex and way more, you know, nudity, basically. Well, because, it's because in the it was, Bible. Because it was based on the, yeah, exactly, because it's, because it's based on the Bible, you know. That's, that's pretty cool. So one of the first movies directed by uh, famed film director and lunatic Stanley Kubrick was Spartacus. Yes. But he basically took over doing every single role in the creation of it. He got, well, that's like, par for Stanley Kubrick, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, Kubrick got very angry and like kicked, like kicked, fired the film, the lighting guy, but then found out that like he couldn't fire the lighting guy, so the lighting guy just turned up to work and sat there all day while Kubrick did the lighting for him. But um, <laughs> like the opening, there's a biography just called Stanley Kubrick, um, and I can't remember who it's by, but it's a, a very entertaining read. And it, the opening scene is during the shooting of Spartacus where um, they've like got a hundred people lying in, in a battlefield and it's like the aftermath of the battlefield and they're all writhing in agony and um, there's like a huge scaffolding and the director sat there with his assistant and the director waves his assistant over and, 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 and whispers into his ear and the assistant brings out a megaphone and goes to the edge of the gantry and shouts extra 462 writhe more <laughs> and, and, and they look where 462 is and 462 is not moving so he goes Extra 462, writhe more. And he's not, so as soon as you go up and go over to 462 and touch it, and he's like, uh, 462 can't writhe. He's like, why? He's like, because 462 is a mannequin. <laughs> um, and that basically sums up Stanley Kubrick. Not even inanimate objects are good enough, not even that are good enough actors of dead people to, to for, for Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick wants more. <laughs> Oh, I like to imagine that they sort of like put like a um, put like a little um, remote controlled like hamster wheel or something inside the mannequin and just drove it around. Well, talking <laughs> We're just about like, now it's writhing. Talking about un, uh, unrealistic or crazy demands by directors. Sure. Uh, there is a documentary about the creation of Twelve Monkeys called The Hamster Effect. Okay. Twelve and Monkeys that- is the. Uh, Film. It's got Bruce Willis in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's sort of a time travel one, isn't it? Time, time travel film starring Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt about a virus that destroys humanity, and yes. they keep repeatedly sending somebody back in time to try and fix it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it to varying degrees of success. And it's a really good movie. It's a beautifully designed film. But there's a scene where there was a scene where he's just come back from. I think he's either just preparing to go or just come back from his first foray into the past. Uh-huh. And Bruce Willis is getting ready to travel there or getting ready to come reintegrate back into society. And they had to shoot it like... They had to shoot it repeatedly, and I mean a huge amount of times. Sure. Because Terry Gilliam wanted the hamster that was in the set to be running in the wheel in a specific direction. <laughs> so, like, there's this big scene, and it is a, it, it's a shot that I think is on screen for less than a minute. Of him sat, and there's like he is taking up just a little bit of the left hand side of the screen. There's all this industrial machinery that's like silhouetted against the light from the background. Yeah. And then there is a hamster wheel, and he wanted the hamster running in a certain direction, silhouetted against the light. Okay. So, you know, I just think that people, if you're a director, you're insane. <laughs> I just I, I kind of picture like the hamster being on like a uh, being on like a chat show or something and like he's he's there in a suit and he's got a cigarette and stuff he's just like oh yeah T- uh, Terry Gilliam like he's a great director but man he really he, re- he works you really hard you know they bring out like a little hamster sized seat for him to sit on never work with children or animals remember I, I there's a really great podcast that um, you should listen to when you stop listening to this one called <laughs> How it got made? Okay. Uh, how did this get? How did this get made? Okay. But basically, the Bams is it's a podcast where a bunch of American comedians watch shitty films and talk about them. Uh, okay. And talk about what the problems with them. Talk about what they thought was just baffling. Talk about what they enjoyed. Talk about Amazon five star reviews from it and just share trivia about it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so they, there's an episode where they they watch Tango and Cash and they talk about it. And they talk about Sylvester Stallone, who is like. Gr- in that period in time was like like he was he was like the golden boy for your picture you know like a, a Stallone movie yes was yeah. Make oh yeah money yeah he was he was basically the golden goose of Hollywood at the time and it just goes through some of the ridiculous absolutely ridiculous 
ridiculous demands he made. So one of them was, there was a character who delivers a line and still was like, hey, uh, why didn't he just deliver that line in a cockney accent? So the guy then has, to, then the guy who is like, I don't know, American, for like, he got like a Los Angeles accent, has to do a really crap cockney accent. And then Sloan's like, uh, yeah, I like his character, let's do more of him. And this guy who comes and delivers one line ends up becoming a big part in the movie because Sylvester Sloan's like, yeah, more of the English guy. And this guy is presumably just like a minor character in the film. Just in, in it's the like they, he, they, they brought him like he's like the, the, the best boy. They like they need him to deliver one line. They grab someone with a film actor's guild membership <laughs> and just put him on screen and then just sees just like a big part of the movie. I mean, obviously, any creative venture, it always it always changes as you're making it, you know. And I, I have, I've not I've not been involved with um, with films for, for 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 quite a long time, but I get the impression that uh, shooting can often be like the most painful part of the process because you never have enough money, you never have enough time, nothing ever looks as good as it did on the storyboards, um, mm. and obviously things change and there are compromises and sometimes scenes have to be cut or sometimes you have to take dialogue from one scene and drop it into another one and you know, move your exposition around and the blocking and all that sort of stuff. But I'm always fascinated by films where that's like par for the course, but then somehow it goes above and beyond that. And the film, well, the whole um, film's narrative focus like changes during shooting. And it's like you're rewriting the script on the go, you know. In, in Tango and Cash, Sylvester Stallone actually got one of the directors fired because... Um, because it wasn't lighting him properly. So we got the director fired. They had to replace the director on a film. Oh, that's like, if that's you, a mutiny. Like, at that point, you've completely lost control. If your actors have yeah. got more power than your, uh, than your director, yeah. then no. But, um, you're doomed to failure at that point. When, when, when Fellini was uh, shooting uh, Eight and a Half, um, he had the words, remember this is a comedy taped under the camera. <laughs> That's like taping the words mandatory fun or like fun fun must occur like above your yeah. uh, above your production studios isn't it I kind of imagine that that's what's on the uh, that's what's on the, the door to um, the happy uh, happy Gilmore uh, or the, 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 sorry, uh, the happy Madison production house where Adam Sandler does all his work it's like everybody must have fun but it's written in like a black metal font you know it's, it's, it's written in like a really threatening kind of way. Warning, fun is mandatory. <laughs>